first thing I have to do when I get to a system is figure out what do I have. I got to get some sort of a hardware and software inventory on the system. Again, there is a command that if a foundation is loaded and it's in the SGI support tools RPM called system underscore info underscore gather. And I usually put a big A and two little V's and then a dash N option on it. And that's going to generate a file with a uh, timestamp on it, host name on it, and verbosity level on it. Now, this newer version, having multiple V options, happened about a year ago. So if you're on a real old uh, performance suite, you won't have multiple Vs capable yet. So we're actually going to spend all of our time this week in slash proc, getting information from slash proc. And there's a lot of different ways of getting information, whether you're using the system info gather script or the commands that it calls, or just going straight into raw slash proc data. We're going to be looking at slash proc data for SAR, performance copilot, top, basically pulling apart everything that we can find in slash proc. And also not mentioned here, but slash sys. There is information in slash sys as well that we will be using. Uh, during my inventory, I just kind of want to get an idea what kind of disk drives I have. In particular, are we talking SATA or SAS or SSD drives? I want to know how those drives are partitioned. And if you're not aware of this, SSD drives also have boundary alignment conditions. Uh, memory bank alignment conditions to get best efficiency out of an SSD, even though it has no mechanical aspects to it, it still has bank alignment types of characteristics to it. Talk briefly about RAID, but again, RAID is part of the second week, the advanced admin class, we get into RAID. But I do want to go through an inventory of the systems, and I've got, uh, I'm going to look at Floyd 3 and NASDAQ server as my example. And that's two different RAIDs on there. List the network devices in the system with netstat-i. Figure out what to collect in a software inventory. Again, system info gather will gather most everything. And I want to get into sysctl parameters. I have made some changes on the system this week. I'm going to play with them, but the sysctl parameters are more detailed in the second week, the advanced admin class. So there are a lot more uh, lab examples and lab demos adjusting dirty ratio, dirty background ratio, things like that. Don't be afraid, those of you that are taking the advanced sysadmin class in a couple of weeks, don't be afraid with that DVD to jump ahead and, and browse through some of the uh, lectures or demos there. Uh, in the future, the less slides I can talk about and the more demo and real work stuff I think is more productive. I'd like to be able to actually just get rid of the uh, slides, let you watch a recording of the slide lecture, and then go straight to labs and demos doing. So we will touch upon sysctl this week, but not in detail. The detail is in the advanced sysadmin class. Also during my inventory, again, I want to check bar log messages for errors, stability problems. I want to quiet down any noise that's in bar log messages. I might want to dump authentication messages into a separate file. Again, it's going to be hard for me to see critical stuff if I've got all kinds of noise in there that has nothing to do with a service problem. And another thing during the inventory that we've got to start off with, I want to start off right away this morning by telling you the slab is the kernel heap. That's the portion of the kernel that grows and shrinks. There is a slab top to tell me what's in that slab. Slab top dash S space C. And in the slab, for example, are my inodes, my directories, things of that sort. Also, again, system info gather is a command written to try to avoid having to run multiple commands to try to get everything in one inventory. 
In fact, I would like you, I'm going to uh, go to my desktop here. I want to see if I can get to uh, NASDAQ server. And I've got a newer, uh, first of all, on NASDAQ server, uh, it's the asterisk R-E-O-E asterisk. This is an old SLUS 11 SP1 server right now. And all I have is infinite storage version 2.2 installed right now. So I've got a, a system info gatherer that is here. I'm just going to do it dot slash system. And by the way, if any of you have a, a system that you'd like to go through with System Info Gather Report as a group, get, gather the report and let me know, and we can go through it as a group. So I'm just going to run this. And notice it's going to write a file off, basically a timestamp in here, host name, and then the verbosity of the inventory, saying that I've got two Vs here. Now, this could take an hour to run. So if you want to log into some system, whether it is a uh, site system that you've got, or you want to log into your Floyd and run that thing, and just let it go for a while. So the dash N is going to write it into a file in the background. Okay. So when I get to a system, I want to know three things. What do I have? What are its technical specs? And how is it put together? So the what do I have is how much and how many. This is a capacity question. So most of this is coming out of slash proc. I want to know how much memory do I have? How much disk space do I have? And when I'm dealing with capacity, things like memory or disk storage, we generally are dealing with a power of two type of number. And power twos are often denoted with an MIB. So uh, like MB would be megabytes, which would be in a power of 10, a million, rounded off to zeros. MIB, we would say it's in powers of two. So for example, a K byte would be 1,000, or KIB would be 1,024. And in older syntax, we also use the up arrow up carrot 2 to indicate that this number is a power of 2 versus a power of 10. So usually when I'm dealing with a capacity type of question, I want to deal in numbers that are in power of 2. If I'm buying a 256 megabyte DIMM, that's not really 256, that's a 264 when you're actually talking about powers of 2. I also want to know how many CPUs I've got and how many disk spindles or disk ones do I have. And some of that's going to require me going into the SMEE GUI to figure out how my LUNs are put together. That's the most painful thing. So last week I had 90 LUNs, 16 paths to each LUN. There were about 1,400 devices on that system. And being able to figure out if SDGGZ goes busy, what that disk drive is and how it fits into the file system. Having some sort of file system disk device mapping. So if I see a disk drive go busy, I know what that disk drive is. I know what file system it is. I know how that file system is put together and what type of I.O. should be going on in that file system. So I've got two RAIDs that are put together. One is on the NASDAQ server and one is on FOID 3. FOID 1 and 2 do not have RAID or a fiber channel adapter on them. The second thing I want to know is what's its technical specs. Basically, look it up. A system benchmarker is going to sit there and say, here's what I'm getting. Here's what I am supposed to get. I want to get as close to theoretical as possible. Some of them will even get down to how many floating point computations can occur per clock period and figure out a megaflop, gigaflop, teraflop performance based upon that. So when 
I'm looking at the CPUs, it's usually instructions per second or floating point operations per second. And then when we get into other resources, we have bandwidth, which is megabytes per second, gigabytes per second, or latency. Now, I've got to give you a story here. I'm going to repeat this throughout the week. you probably heard this story before. I do not like the word fast. I usually give the analogy here, if we were all in the same classroom, for example, I would say, which is faster to get this class to downtown Minneapolis? Ferrari, school bus, or 747? Well, since three of you are overseas, the 747 is going to be the best choice for you. I understood the payload characteristics. For me, I'm alone. I can take a Ferrari and get downtown quicker than a school bus or a 747. So, again, it goes back to your payload characteristics. Now, let me repeat that. Which is faster, a Ferrari, a school bus, or a 747? Well, the 747 is the fastest device. It's moving four or 500 miles per hour versus a school bus that maybe is doing 40 to 60 miles an hour and a Ferrari that could do 200 miles an hour. But once I put in the K payload characteristics and said, which is going to be faster to get this class to downtown Minneapolis? Well, since, two, since three of you are overseas, the 747 is your best choice. If we were all in the same classroom at the same time and there were four of us, the four of us would probably not fit into a Ferrari and the school bus would be the better choice. So if you think about this, the 747 is a ray choice. It's good for large sequential I.O. The Ferrari is a fast drive, a SCSI drive. It's spinning faster. It has lower latency. And then the school bus is a theta drive. It is better at bandwidth, but is spinning slower and does not have the latency. So this, again, goes back to know your payload characteristics to figure out what your choices are. Now, I want to repeat this again. When I said which is better, Ferrari School Bus or 747, the ultimate question you're answering is, does my payload fit? Two of us fit in a Ferrari. If it's 30 of us, we can't fit in the Ferrari. I don't want to do lots of little Ferrari trips. I'd rather load you all into a school bus and take the school bus. So this whole issue, latency versus bandwidth and proper choice, goes back to does it fit? Does my application and the memory space it allocated in the data segment, plus any files it reads into the page cache, do those fit on socket on node? If I can solve everything off the memory that's attached to the socket, attached to the processor, that's going to be my best performance. If my assets are larger than what, what will fit on that socket, then I need to get into some sort of round-robin interleaf scheming to spread it across the nodes. So if it fits, I want latency. If it doesn't fit, I want bandwidth. And that's the ultimate question you're always asking about, do I want first touch or do I want round-robin? I want first touch if I can hold it local and stay local and keep it local and not lose affinity to it. If it doesn't fit, then i got to go to an interleave round-robin bandwidth concept. If I'm doing credit card transactions, I don't want to spread that across all the nodes in the system. I want to keep that local in my node. So I hate the word fast. I need to get that into something that I can measure. And I can have a fast system that has high floating point capability but is performing very poorly interactively because it's star for I.O., for example. So anyways, I want to know how much I have, what its technical specs are, and then how it's put together. So later in the week, we are going to go through the CPU architecture and talk about the Halem, Westmere, Sandy Bridge, and get into the architecture of the processor and the socket itself and the cores that are on it. Then I also want to get into memory, memory topology, CC NUMA, and directory memory. And then for disk drives, we've got to worry about disk geometry. And even SSD drives, we do have to worry about geometry alignment. 
so that we don't have uh, IO operations crossing uh, bank boundaries that are on the DIMMs. And when I get into a topology situation, how the network or the NUMA link or the RAID is put together. So we kind of use the word topology to describe a fancy way of saying how are these components put together. For the CPU, we call it the architecture. For the interconnect and for RAID, we call it the topology. And I want to worry about alignment. I need to worry about CPU cache line alignment, things being on 64-byte boundaries. I need to worry about memory topology alignment so that I stay on socket, so I stay on the memory that's attached to the socket. And I need to worry about disk alignment so that my I.O. requests are friendly to the geometry or the alignments of my file system, whether it's an SSD or a RAID or whatever. So again, when I get into my inventory, I want to figure out how many CPUs, how much memory, how many nodes or sockets, how many disk drives, how are those disk drives put together. So first of all, hwinfo-short, now that is a SLES command only. If I'm on Red Hat, I don't have that command. I don't find the command that useful, really. I'll get into another flavor of it that I do find useful, but it doesn't, for example, give me detailed memory information. And hwinfo without dash dash short is extremely verbose on a large CPU system. I've modified system info gather so that I do not get a fully verbose report. If I got 4096 CPUs, I don't want a couple of gig of ASCII data to tell me about those CPUs. So the Prior system info gather used to have just one V. That is now the same thing as five Vs to be able to get a fully verbose HW info report. I don't think most people use all five of a fully verbose HW info. It gets extremely large on a large CPU system. So this is kind of showing a UV1000 block diagram. What's unique about the SGI product line is something that we call the hub, or nowadays called the harp, or the bedrock, or the shub. We are on our sixth generation of the hub. We started back in 1995-96 with the Origin 2000, and the first generation of what was called NumaLink. Now this shub NumaLink protocol was based upon something from Stanford University called the Dash. And what's key to our product is the stuff called directory memory. So what we've got here in directory memory is a word descriptor word for every 64-byte cache line on the system. And this directory memory is used for cache coherency. If a processor writes to a cache line, directory memory will have a bit set for every CPU that has a copy of that cache line. And if I modify the cache line, I am going to broadcast or multicast to all the CPUs that are sharing that cache line, send them an invalidation, an intervention, and tell them, I just modified this cache line. You need to rewarm, reload that cache line, take a cache miss, and rewarm it so that you're coherent with the change that I made. So directory memory has a bit descriptor for every 64 bytes of memory on the system with a bit set saying this CPU has a copy of it. If I change a cache line, change a byte value, or you know, eight byte item on a cache line, those entire 64 bytes have to be rewarmed across the system to make them coherent. So anyways, within the UV1000, we have two Nehalem or Westmere sockets, and they each have their own memory directly attached to the socket. They also have Intel's interconnect protocol called Quick Path Interconnect. This is kind of a, uh, an answer. This is kind of like an Intel version of NumaLink. Now, Quick Path Interconnect does not scale like NumaLink. NumaLink is meant for the large socket counts on the high end, whereas Quick Path Interconnect is more on the low end. Also attached to the Quick Path Interconnect is my PCI. 
Nowadays, with Sandy Bridge, the PCI is actually attached to the socket now. And I should have a drawing coming up, but the two sockets on a UV2000 have separate quick path interconnects. That way, traffic coming into one socket is not going to saturate the quick path interconnect to the other socket. On UV2000s, the two sockets are on separate blades or separate motherboards that are a part of a dual motherboard blade, but each one has its own quick path interconnect. Also, with the UV2000, instead of four NumaLink ports coming out of the hub, we now have 16 ports coming out of the heart. And that 16 ports allows us to build a bigger all-to-all -all interconnect before we have to start going into other types of topologies like Hypercube and Fat Tree and Taurus 2D type of topologies. I'm not too concerned about all the numbers on this thing, but that's just a block diagram of what a UV1000 motherboard looks like for our system. Here's a UV2000 now. So you have two blades, or two I should say two motherboards that are stacked together. There's a bottom and a top that are put together as a dual circuit board blade. And again, each of these Sandy Bridge sockets have their own memory and their own quick path interconnect. The two nodes on that dual blade or that dual motherboard blade are isolated from each other. And then coming off the side of it is the hub, the shove, the heart, whatever you want to call it. It has NumaLink connecting into the back plane and NumaLink going to the network extender blade such that we can connect multiple IRUs together. Don't worry too much about this, but basically, again, we have two separate sockets with two separate quick path interconnects tied into one harp with 16 ports coming off that harp. So Proc CPU Info is one place you can go to get your CPU information. Kind of throws people off, but we start off with CPU Zero being the first CPU. I don't mention it in this workbook, but lately, Instead of getting that for boasting, I've just been grepping CPU in slash proc slash stat. That can also give me a, a shorter CPU info report. Then you're just going to get one line per CPU instead of all this other stuff. There is an SGI command called CPU map. Now, this is part of the accelerate. ISO. It may not be loaded on your system if you don't have Accelerate installed. With Intel, Intel has their own command called CPU Info that does the same sort of thing. So I'm going to use CPU Map quite a bit, telling me what kind of processor I have and everything, what my cache size is. But another key thing here is number of cores. So I've got uh, eight sockets in the system, four cores per socket, but I've also got hyper-threading turned on, so this system has 64 CPUs, two per core. And then the key thing here is the map thing. So here's my hub or my harp or my shub. This is the blade that I'm on, and then this is showing me my physical CPUs, so zero through seven. And then 32 through 39 are the hyperthread or virtuals. Now you have to be a little bit careful here, depending upon the system that I have in the architecture. For example, some of my ICE systems. The ICE BIOS might go physical, virtual, physical, virtual, physical, virtual. Whereas here we're going physical, 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 then virtual, 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 virtual. This will also make a difference if I am cloning a root Maybe I've got a, uh, a eight-blade IRU that I built a test cloned root from, cloned it off and gave it to my other engineers that have their own IRUs, but they have different blade counts in them. And now everything that was hard-coded onto that particular clone root is going to be skewed in terms of number of CPUs and stuff like that. So, for example, if I was to create a boot CPU set, 
and I wanted 0 through 7 and 32 through 39 to be that boot CPU set. And then I cloned this root off to a different IRU that has a different blade count, the CPU numbering scheme is all going to be different and you have to re-evaluate it. So be real careful about that when you're going across different types of systems. So this is showing me the hub or the harp that I'm on, the blade location, rack, IRU, blade number, and then the core number or the CPU number with the parentheses being the hyperthread. Now people always ask, or I need to explain hyperthreads. Basically, when a process is running on a core, it has a program counter or instruction pointer, same thing, and it has internal registers. When I disconnect that process from the CPU and connect something else, I have to save off the program counter, the instruction pointer, and all the internal registers. That's known as the state or the context. So every time I do a context switch, disconnect a process, connect a new process, I have to save off the state or the program counter and the registers. Now, a wafer has only so much space on it. And there may not be space on that wafer to have two separate cores. If I'm going to go from four cores to eight cores, there may not be enough room on that wafer to get eight cores. But what they can do is take a core and have two states on core. So a hyperthread basically says there are two sets of program counters and two sets of internal registers. And when I do a context switch, I just have to flip between these two states that are on core. In the older kernels, if I did a context switch, I would save that state off to memory and then context switch to the new state. Now I've got two states on core. And by the way, we're going to see this, the two hyperthreads can share the instruction pipe and keep the instruction pipe busy. I'll come back to this. But later in the class, if I have a non-hyperthread system, I could have two threads, each with instructions in the in pipe. And if I do a branch, everything in the instruction pipe would get thrown away. Then I'd go on to the other thread. With hyperthreads, I can flip back and forth between the two states and keep the functional units more likely busy. So again, basically a hyperthread says I've got two states on core, two sets of program counters, two sets of registers, and I can context switch with a lot less overhead, and I can overlap the two states in the instruction pipe and keep the core busy. Any questions right now? So. Most laptops and most systems I have nowadays are a unify, uniform memory access. If I have just one socket, I have one memory. CPU access is any memory with the same latency. We used to call this a central memory system. The problem is, is the CPU counts get higher and higher. The front side bus concept, these were front side bus type systems in the day, would saturate if everything was on the same bus trying to get to memory. Even nowadays, we have cases where the quick path interconnect can saturate, which is why with UV2, we have separated the sockets so that each socket has its own quick path interconnect and cannot saturate going off to memory or off to IO or off to the uh, CC NUMA on the system. So with a uniform memory access, you just got one flat, large central memory. Good, simple, don't have to worry about placement. Uh, these systems are a cache coherent concept called Snoop Cache. Snoop Cache is what Intel is using, what AMD is using. There's a protocol known as MESI, Messy Protocol. Now SGI's HARP, or Bedrock or Shub Chip, is converting SGI's NUMA link CC NUMA into Snoop Cache. 
So the processors that you have, the Nehalem, Westmere, Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, are all Snoop cache-based. They have pins on the socket that basically show memory addresses that are being modified, and a core can say, oh, an address just showed up on my Snoop line that I have a copy of, and therefore I have to rewarm my cache line to be coherent with the change. The trouble is, is that that Snoop cache line can get saturated. As my memory gets bigger and bigger, I can't watch everything. So by going to a CC NUMA concept, we have filtered out that Snoop cache, and the sockets on that blade only show the Snoop traffic for what that blade owns. It's not looking at the entire system. This gives us scalability on the high end. So what we got now is a cache coherent, non-uniform memory architecture. Nowadays, I can also have a standard OEM uh, super micro motherboard that might have eight sockets that are quick path interconnect. That is also a CC NUMA protocol, but is using QPI, not NUMA link for cache coherency. So in a CC NUMA, we have non-uniform memory architecture Nowadays, the memory is tightly coupled to the CPU. Don't think of this as one big supercomputer. Think of this as a bunch of tightly coupled PCs. And basically, you want to split up your work and stay on socket and not be going off socket for anything. Think of this as a bunch of tightly coupled laptops. Think of these as a bunch of tightly coupled processors that are coupled together by NUMA link and CC NUMA protocol rather than a Snoop Cache Quick Path Interconnect protocol. So the memory now is tightly coupled to the CPU. Let me go off here for a second. So let's just say I got a processor here. I got a processor over here. I've got a NumaLink switch over here. And then attached to these things is the memory. So my best performance is if I can stay on socket, on blade, and do all my memory references local, assuming that I can fit it local. If I have to go across the interconnect to get to memory on another blade, that's going to raise my latency and cut into my bandwidth. I want to keep everything on socket. Even better, some of these kernels and stuff like that will decompose, break up the array. It was even talked about recently that uh, I could solve it on cache and never even go off to local memory and stay on core. They're talking about uh, Monte Carlo algorithms recently being able to stay on core, stay in the L1, L2, and that's going to be your best performance. If I can stay on core, then I get what's called a super linear speed up, and I don't even have to go off to local memory, let alone go across the interconnect to get to remote memory. So NUMA is distributed among the CPUs and the hub, just call it a network interconnect, except it's not using Ethernet or InfiniBand protocol, it's using SGI's proprietary NUMA link protocol. Now, the Nehalem chip or Westmere or uh, Ivy Bridge nowadays is a Snoop Cache. AMD processors are Snoop Cache. The CPU watches memory addresses going by on the Snoop lines. And our hub, our SGI proprietary chip, is converting that uh, Snoop Cache into CC NUMA and then sending intervention invalidation lines using directory memory to the CPUs that have a copy of that cache line. Now, I'm kind of an old person here. When I used to use DOS and I would boot up a DOS system, 
when caches started, it would call it shadow RAM. In other words, my cache is a shadow of physical memory. If I make a change on chip to the cache line that is a shadow or a copy of physical memory, I've got to make sure that that change propagates and is pushed out to everybody else that has a copy of it. The problem is if it's a pull mechanism, there's contention there. So instead, we use a push mechanism. Snoop cache is a pull. Snoop cache is I'm watching, and oh, I own, I have a copy of that resync. But SGI's proprietary hardware using this directory memory concept will say, oh, I just did a write to a cache line. It will go to directory memory and figure out what CPUs have a copy of that cache line. So we have in directory memory a descriptor for every 64 bytes. As the memory gets bigger and bigger, I might need more DIMMs to describe that memory. In that directory memory, then, we have bits to describe what CPUs are sharing a cache line. If a CPU modifies or writes, that's what's key here. If I write to a cache line, all their CPUs have to sync that up and be coherent. So what SGI's NumaLink CC NUMA protocol does is broadcast, multicast to these CPUs using that bit mask and intervention and invalidation. Basically, I just modified a cache line. I'm going to broadcast using the directory memory bit mask and kick the other CPUs in the pants, kick them in the butt and tell them, rewarm your cache line. And then the hub on that particular blade is then going to convert that CC NUMA, NUMA link protocol back into Snoop Cache so that the processors on that motherboard, on that blade, only see the Snoop traffic for what they control or care about. And that gives me scalability again. Now, this directory memory is separate DIMMs, whereas on our Itanium product lines, it was out of main memory. And, again, to be clear here, a socket is what we plug the processor into. The processor is the chip itself. Nowadays, it is a Sandy Bridge processor. It, have, it has multiple cores and multiple CPUs on it. But a node, a socket, a processor, the memory attached to the processor are all the same thing. So the node is the socket's memory, what's attached directly to the socket. Any questions? So we are going to be looking at per node, and that word node is used a lot of different ways. PBS refers to a node differently. Even the topology command refers to a node differently. you got to be careful about the use of the word node. So there is a command called node info, and it's going in here. By the way, it has moved in the next release. There is a new uh, uh, kernel. There is a new RPM called HWPerf that's in the foundation. So it got moved out of SGI. I should make a note here. It used to be in PCP. Dash SGI. Now it's in HWPerf with the next May release that's coming up. It's no longer part of PCP. Basically, PCP SGI is SGI's proprietary package, but they're pulling things that are not connected to PCP that were put in there before as a convenient place to put them. Now I'm going to come back and use node info, but first we get the node number. So that's basically the socket number and the memory that's attached to that socket. Total amount of memory, so I've got 16 gig per socket, two sockets per blade, giving me 32 gig per blade. And in this case, most of my memory is free. 14 out of the 16 gig is free. I've got two gig that's used here. I need to come back to this, but dirty. Dirty is data that I've written to disk but is not flushed yet. 
dirty data is still sitting in memory waiting for a delayed write, waiting for the flush daemon or the sync command to flush it. So dirty data is data that is waiting to flush to disk. Anon is my process space. So if I allocate the terabyte array, the anon is going to be the array space. And the slab is the kernel heap. My inodes and directories are in the slab. And when I am doing memory references, when I allocate the page, I want to see all the pages allocated first touch with a hit on my node. If I run out of memory, for example, if somebody came along, allocated all the memory on the node that I'm going to get to a dev shemem file, they go away, they don't remove their dev shemem file, I then come up on that node, I might end up going foreign saying I have to go off node to get the memory allocations, and somewhere else, the node that I'm coming into, it will be counted as a miss. So every foreign results in a miss. This is going to be bad because that means latency problems. But the allocation is not the same thing as the actual reference of the data later. So this just shows me when I'm allocating. Now there's also the ability, instead of first touch, to do a round robin or an interleave. Let me save this for Friday. So I put these sockets together, these processor packages together. A quick pass interconnect will do an all to all. But again, we are limited by the number of ports that are available on our small systems. As the system gets bigger and bigger, we run out of ports. The next type of topology we call a hypercube or an enhanced hypercube or a 3D hypercube. This will scale better to large systems. The switch requirements scale linearly with the system size and the cabling can be distributed and the hop count and latency stays low. Then you can get into what's called a torus or mesh topology, the UV1000, when you get into really large, for example, getting larger than 64 racks, then you get into what's called a torus 2D topology. And then when you get larger than that, for example, on our ICE systems and prior systems, we might have had a flat fat tree topology, in fact, a dual plane fat tree topology. So on our ICE systems, the InfiniBand might have been hooked together into a IB0 and IB1, which are two separate fabrics that are put together into a fat tree, or combination. So I might have on a blade an all-to-all. -all. Within the IRU, I might have an I hypercube. Within my host, I might have a Taurus 2D. And then when I'm going past, say, 256 racks, I might have a fat tree topology. Now, as the number of ports to NumaLink goes up, for example, I've gone from four ports to 16 ports off my NumaLink, I can have more all-to-all -all and less of the fat tree type of interconnect. So here we're just trying to show some topology showing two racks with each of these being a blade, memory attached to the blade, and then the interconnect between the particular blades. Here is a UV-1000 showing a Taurus 2D topology. Basically, I have four racks here. Each of these boxes represents a rack. And then inside that, we've got two IRUs with 16 sockets to each IRU. And these double fat pipes here, basically each circle is a hub, and then the double link connections are on the same IRU in the back plane versus something that's going through these switches. So these light lines are showing things through the switches, whereas the thick one is straight through the back, black back plane. Now here's a UV2000, so I've got eight IRUs here or two racks as my building block, and these have been connected in a 3D enhanced hypercube topology. So we're showing each of these uh, one, two, three, four, showing the hubs within them, 
and the routers that are connecting them into this hypercube topology. Okay, so each uh, blade, basically, eight blade, eight different hubs to build this system. Now, this is more of a UV-1000, so if I have a 256 socket, that tree groups in eight of eight. Each of these green dots is representing a four-rack group. Each of those green dots is representing this drawing here, showing the largest single system image for a SLEP system of 4,096 CPUs. Red Hat does not, the kernel in Red Hat does not scale as big as the SLES kernel. So each of those four rack single system images is this green dot, and I've got an eight by eight. That's 64 single system images, or 64 roots here, each of them being a four rack 4096 CPU system. So basically a four rack group in an eight by eight is giving me 256 racks or 16,000 sockets in this system. And then if I wanna go larger than that, then I have to go to a dual plane fat tree and that will get me up to 32,000 processors or sockets with maybe up to 12 or 16 CPUs on each socket. Basically, we can scale to whatever you have for your budget. So the upper limit is 32,000 sockets. Anyways, a couple of inventory commands here. The CMC serial-V command can give me things like field replaceable part numbers. You run it on the CMC or the SMN. You have the topology command. And in the recent releases, the topology command is now a short version. So I have to do a topology-all to see a verbose that gives me per blade information, per CPU information. This does require a kernel module known as hwperf. So the topology command requires the hwperf command to be available. And there is a slash proc slash SGI underscore UV asterisk slash topology file that is created when the HWPerf kernel module is loaded. If that HWPerf kernel module is not loaded, there is no proc SGI UV directory. If I'm on a UV2, by the way, it's SGI underscore UV2. There are uh, things like PBS Pro that will go into that topology, flat topology file on its own to do topology placement for jobs. And that topology file is an ASCII file, but the topology command can basically summarize it. There is another option here that I'm gonna talk about later in the week. A topology dash IO dash AFF dash V. Topology dash IO will show me my peripherals. Dash AFF will show me where the peripherals are plugged in. It'll show me which HBA is plugged into which node board, which blade. And dash V will give me additional information like the interrupt number that that peripheral has interrupts coming in on and number of interrupts that have come in on that particular peripheral. So the dash V will give me some verbose information. Uh, on x86 systems, we also have a DMI decode command. One of the things that will get in there is my vendor, and then what kind of brick do I have? So I can get the model number of the motherboard off of it. And then things like the BIOS and stuff that's in there. Also, the MI decode will get into my memory DIMMs to tell me what the memory DIMM sizes are like and information about the DIMM. LS SCSI, we're going to take a break here in a little bit.
but LSCSI will print out the peripherals that are attached to my system, all the SCSI and SAS types of drives. The first field here is known as the bus ID. Known as the bus ID. This is simply the order of discovery. So each of these, it's kind of hard to read here. The first field is the controller that I'm on. So in this example, I see a controller 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I've got five controllers visible on this particular system. The second field then is the bus, and they are all on the same bus. The third field is the target. Now, I have direct attached disks here, so the targets are simply going one, two, three, four. These are DASD disks that are plugged in here. In fact, this is an older Itanium system, and I can see that these are Seagate drives attached in here. The last field here is the LUN, and that's going to be something relating to my RAID storage. Now, when I come back from break, I'm going to go through this and take a look at a couple of systems and figure out this stuff. When you build your RAIDs with the SME GUI, you try to pick a LUN numbering scheme that is meaningful to you. For example, I might say LUNs 10 to 20 are home. LUNs 60 to 100 are for scratch. LUNs 40 to 60 are for the database. Give some sort of naming convention to the LUN number so that when you see a LUN number, you know how, what file system that one number is mapped into. After the bus ID, we have the type of device, the vendor, and then the model. ST stands for Seagate. These are Seagate drives here. We also have the firmware level and then the device name. And the device name is not persistent. If I were to lose SDI and reboot, everything would shift up one. And you generally try to avoid device names. Unfortunately, things like top disk and SAR and stuff are showing disk activity by name. And then you've got to map it back to the device. I need to give you a little trick here right now. When I am in XVM, I need to do a show with XVM. Show dash v on, for example, slash dev slash sdc, and then that will tell me what device sdc is in XVM terms. So XVM has what's called path manager, and you'll see it's this will convert a sdc into a slash dev slash pm path for path manager. And that's unique to SGI's XVM interface. So I'm going to have to do that after a break coming up. Now, uh, again, NASDAQ Server and Floyd 3 have more complicated file systems because I was able to attach RAID to them. Now, if I don't have LSCSI, for example, if I'm in rescue mode or an installer kernel, I can proc, I can cat proc SCSI SCSI, and then that's where the LSCSI is getting its information. So here I get the uh, the channel, the ID, the one, the model number, things of that sort. Now, I do like to use an HW info dash dash disk. I wish that this was available on Red Hat. It is not. I can only do this on SLES. And in particular, what I really like to get is prepping for this. And this will give me one line for the device. And now I can see all the different names for the same device. So I can see SDF is SCSI ID, and this is basically a serial number here. So I can see it's a Seagate drive here. I could pull that drive, look at the paper label, and see the ID here. I can also see the path and the port number that is coming out on, things of that sort. This is 
the hard part if I've got 1,400 devices and 90 different LUNs with 16 paths to each LUN, this is going to be an extremely large verbose report. I need to may be able to map that back and say, oh, SDGZA, whatever the device name is, is showing busy and top. I want to know what file system that is. And I would normally actually have some sort of spreadsheet or drawing that would help me map the lawns and stuff back to the file system. So I have an easy way to see if this device is busy, what file system does it belong in. There's also LSPCI. Now in System Info Gather, I am getting rid of all the Intel lines so that I can see any peripherals that are not Intel but that also throws away the two Intel motherboard network interfaces, which would not be visible. But LSPCI, without it on a large CPU count, you're going to get a lot of lines about all the Intel stuff that is part of the motherboard without actually getting into the peripherals themselves. So I like to get rid of the grep or get rid of the Intel line. If I did system info gather with four Vs, then I would get a fully verbose report without filtering out all the Intel lines. That's dash, dash I showing me the network interfaces I have, mean ma maximum transmission unit size, things of that sort. Software inventory. I already did this on my system. It's the asterisk R-E-L-E-A asterisk. If I'm on Red Hat, I might pick up a binary. So I do an R-E-L-E-A or, or full, spell out fully release to pick up both the Nobel and the SGI release level. Zipper can show me what I've got and also list my repositories, Zipper LR. Now, Slats has something called SAM, which is a supportability analysis module. They'll basically sanity check the RPMs. And SGI has one called SGI RPM Sensible. Let me put that into chat. SGI-RPM-Sensible is uh, basically a command to make sure that all the RPMs for SGI software are at the same release level. You don't want to have mixed kernel modules or things of that sort. Also wanted the SGI release level. And then I also grabbed the kernel name. I am kind of interested in the kernel that showed up with the update server as being something new. But I want to run with the current kernel that I've got that has a patch in it so that node-aware trims are working correctly. This heady kernel that I have installed right now if I were to allocate memory on a node, it should trim the page cache and the slab on that node before it goes off node. That has currently not been working in the Novell kernel that has been available in the past. I don't know about the kernel that's now available this week. But we'll come back to that. Uh, SysCTL-A to show me my kernel tunables and also a SysCTL-Comp file to see if any tunables have been set by the customer. I'll come back to that. Check config. Turn off any demons I don't need. Why have a web server running if I never use it? RPM QA. And it's handy to do a dash dash last if you've never used that. Then I can see recent RPMs that have been installed. What's my swap configuration? What's my file system layout? We're going to have to do this a little bit, but that's really part of the advanced sysadmin class. But I need to look at Floyd 3 and Nash Dash Server to see what their file systems are like and then figure out if they're XFS file systems or extended 3 file systems. And for XVM, I want to get in and show dash T dash E. Again, I'm going to demonstrate it on Nash Dash Server. And Floyd 3 also has a RAID XVM that's installed. And also, I want to watch interprocess communication, IPCS command, and LS-L on Deb Shemem. So, System Info Gather will run all these commands. 
Now I've modified the output a little bit such that there is a header before each command. If I just do a grep with an up caret dash dash space indicating that I'm going to sort on the first columns being equal, equal space, then I'm going to get every command and what the syntax is like and the timestamp for it. So I can even see, let's see, 21, 21, 22. I can see how long it's taking. So I started at 2150 and ended at 2233 here. Took less than uh, half a minute so far just for this portion of the report. It also allows me to easily go into the file and search on a particular report. So I can actually see what's in there. And then I can go in with VI and do a search on up arrow, again, up arrow, equal, equal space, and then page through to the next portion of the report. Uh, system info gather can take quite a bit of time. Again, check config, get rid of any init services I don't need, turn off web servers, things like that. I also want to check my cron tab. System Info Gather is grabbing my cron tab. We're going to drop a cron tab in for Performance Copilot. And then there are cron tabs in there for hourly, daily, weekly, and monthly. I'm going to warn you right now that I have a daily cron tab in there for the locate utility. And there's going to be a find command that's going to be fired up by cron to build the locate database. Watch for it. Again, configure off all unneeded services. This can reduce noise and contention. When I get into my disk inventory, I need to get the bus ID, which is basically the logical order of discovery. Then I also want to see the serial number or by ID that will be unique. So when I get to a site, I'll do an ls-l on by ID and get rid of a few things in there that are part by partition and by worldwide names and get the number of LUNs that are being presented to me. Let me save that for demo here. I also want the physical path to it. So if I have 16 paths, there are going to be 16 names to it, 16 paths to it, but only one serial number to it. And unfortunately, all my statistics are by name, so I've got to be able to map that back to the proper LUN and the file system conveniently. I also can look at things by UUID. When you make a file system with MakeFS, it gets a universally unique ID in the super block. I can also create things by label. If I remake FS, the UUID or the label will be different. I also have to worry about major minor numbers. The flush daemon is going to have a major minor number after it, and I need to map that major minor number back to the file system. There are times in var log messages you only get a major minor number. You might get an XVM-2, and you get a major minor number for it, and you've got to figure out what file system that is. So I've got to be able to get from a major minor number back to the device and back to the file system. Then I want to know how that device is mounted, and also what kind of vendor it is, what model is it, is it RAID, how is the RAID built, and what's the capacity of the drive. Now, our UV1s, we're using a hardware RAID or hardware mirroring. When UV2 came out, they, were, they had a different uh, – RAID processor chip, they were using the Passberg instead of an LSI chip, and therefore they could not do LSI hardware RAID. But what is happening nowadays is the base I.O. module has a PCI slot in it. We are now sticking a LSI RAID controller on that slot, and now we can do hardware RAID for my root. Now, the problem was if I had two physical disks and I tried to use MD or LVM to do my hardware mirroring, the dump utility would corrupt the root because dump did not understand a software mirrored device. So I've gone off to a different system here. LSCSI is showing that I have SDA as an LSI logical volume. And then the two disks that are in it have
have a dash to them. Now, with the Floyds that I have, the rays, the mirrors, the hardware mirrors have been broken already because I need that second disc for labs and for scratch. You're going to have XVM labs and things like that that are being put on the second disc. So, in this particular example, I actually logged into an ICE system, did an LS SCSI to see my two Hitachi drives, see that SDA is a logical device, and then when I went into LSI Util, I go to a group 16 that will print the devices, and then I can see the two serial numbers of those particular device, devices that make up my root. Now, I did have one class came to the site. They were going to use their UV. They pulled their root and their root's mirror out and put in new disks. But they did not modify LSI Util, and the serial numbers that were at the RAID firmware level did not match the two drives they just plugged in. So basically, when we came up to BIOS, the BIOS did not see the new two RAID or the new two spindles that were put in because the LSI util command did not have the prior uh, spindles removed from the array and the two new spindle serial numbers added as a new array. So they would have had to come up with an MS-DOS flash stick, run LSI util from that flash stick, and then delete the older drives and add in the two new drives with their serial numbers in order for me to install an OS on the scratch drives. So LSI Util is needed to maintain the firmware RAID. Any questions? So I want to take a break here, then come back and start doing a quick demo of my file system and draw it out. Both Floyd 3 and NASDAQ server have complex file systems. Also, during my inventory, I want to check for my Unix process communication, what's known as semaphores, messages, and shared memory. These are reserved out of virtual memory. The process that reserved it has to release the resource. If I create a file in DevShamem and get killed and never remove my file, I now have a memory leak. Same thing with inter-process communication and IPCS. You could run a program and end up with a memory leak again. These are allocated out of memory. So I could come in, try to do a BC free, try to trim all my memory, and then it's all still there because of IPCS stuff. So with IPCS AM, I want to look for unattached shared memory segments. And there's a column right here. I can see that I've got three unattached shared memory segments. Now, I need to know my applications and my market to know whether I can remove those or not. So there are some markets where uh, those are going to have a process attached to them later. But once I've decided that those are a memory leak and uh, shared memory segments that are no longer being used, I can remove them with IPCRM. For example, an application, maybe it's Gaussian that uses shared memory, hits a, me hits a CPU time limit, the process gets killed, never frees up its shared memory, and they remain unattached. I do have an example cron event that will remove any unattached shared memory segments. And I'm going to use that during the week as I need to. Uh, the script that I've got is called Clear Shamem. And we're going to have to deal with slash home guest bin. For widgets and commands that I have that are not part of the release. Okay, during the inventory process, I'm going to talk about this a little bit this week, but the second week is when we get into sysctl. So sysctl is a way of changing kernel parameters. It's basically modifying things in proc sys. No boot is required. A sysctl-w will change a parameter immediately. It does require root to make these changes. 
Assist Detail Dash A will show what all the current settings are. And then also in my inventory, I grab SysDetail.com to see what's been added. Now, in order for that SysDetail.com to work, there's a boot.sysdetail script that runs on boot. It's a good idea to check SysDetail.com during your inventory. Sometimes I find things in there that are wrong, period. Some things that were in there as a workaround from five years ago but are not relevant anymore. Sometimes one of these parameters has caused the problem. Now, when we ship to CTL, we're basically shipping at best safe middle of the road. Your job as a system administrator is to understand your workload characteristics and make better decisions. For example, the dirty uh, rep for dirty in the sysctl command. Now, one of the things I can do is comment out the parameter sysctl.com, and then on the next reboot, I will get the default again. One of the things that I don't like here, let me share my desktop. I'm sorry, share a whiteboard here. A lot of these sysctl settings are a linear response. So, for example, over here might be threads dash max. Oops. Now, let me do it this way. Over here might be my memory size. And then down here might be the threads dash max value, which is the maximum number of processes that can exist on the system. And this linear scale is often built upon the memory size. So if I have a very, very large memory system, my threads dash max might just get out of range, and I might be better off setting it so that I cannot get too many threads. Let me demonstrate that coming up in a minute. So the bigger the memory size, the bigger a process storm I can create. back here. So here's a sysctl a uh, In System Info Gather, I'm getting rid of all the uh, per CPU stuff because that can get really verbose. And in particular, the key group that I deal, do deal with is the VM group. We'll talk about some of those. So several ways of setting it. First of all, I prefer to put all my changes in one place in sysctl.com. That way it's easier to find them. If I scatter them all over the place, that's a trouble. And I've got to have the check config boot sysctl.com on. Now that is a SLES path, too. Some sites may have an rc.local that simply echoes a value into the proxy file system, or they might do a sysctl to set something. If you're in Temple and ICE, in ITSIOP, SGICOP.D is where a lot of these sysctl settings are hard-coded. It's not very easy within uh, Temple to go in and change things because they get stepped on every time you boot your system. Another key command, we're about ready to take a break here. Slab top gives me how big my kernel is. Always sort by the size column. So here I can see that I have sorted by this. And buffer underscore head is for raw I.O. So I don't care about anything else other than the last two columns. I don't care about number of objects or anything like that. I just want the only thing that matters to me are these two fields here. Everything else is useless to me. Don't care about any of it. But if I have a 200 gig kernel, I want to know what's in that kernel space. Now this is actually coming out of slash proc slash slab info. And let's see if I can spot it here. 
One of the things in the slab, for example, is my process table. When I type in a PS command, I am printing out the process table right here, pass truck. If I'm doing an LS, I'm printing out the inodes and the directories, things of that sort. So one of the things that an administrator needs to know is if I got a 32 terabyte machine and all the memory is gone, I want to know where the memory went, how it's being used, and if that is productive memory use. And if I have a fine command that has made my slab 100 gig and that's non-productive, I want to do something about that. So I'm wrapping up here. We'll take a break and come back and do a demo. And I have one more module to do. So HW info to give me my hardware inventory. Again, proc CPU info, but I've also been going in lately into slash proc slash sked. Not stack, I'm sorry. Slash proc slash stack. I'm going to spend a lot of time in proc mem info this week. Also on a per CPU basis or per memory basis, I can get into sys devices. Prox SCSI SCSI for my disk or an LS SCSI command. LSI util will tell me about firmware LSI prom. I want to look at partitioning of my drives, peripherals, my topology command, and making a note here, dash IO, dash AFF, dash V. And netstat dash I for my network interface information. For the software, I want to know the OS and the release level. If somebody comes to me with a problem, the first thing I want to know is what OS are you running, what kernel are you running. Secondly, it takes a long time to do this, but when I come back, I want to draw out the file system as best I can. And I want to figure out which file systems are XFS or XVM or Extended 3. I want to check my interprocess communication reservations. I want to check to see if SysCTL has had any changes, and I need to deal with stability issues. Checking dmessage and var log messages for noise, and seeing if I'm hitting any memory limits. A whole bunch of references here. This is a key one. I like that one quite a bit to look at my SysCTL parameter settings. And then I've also got them documented on the file system itself. I would have that thing bookmarked to be able to look at descriptions for my SysCTL parameters. So when I come back from break, and you're going to be assigned yours as well, how many CPUs and details about the CPU? How much memory and how many sockets or nodes do I have? How many disk drives do I have? How many spindles do I have? How many LUNs do I have? What PCI peripherals do I have? Fiber channel controllers. What are my network interfaces? There is an exercise if I have a SAR binary to figure out how much CPU and how much memory I have coming out of that file. I want to determine what release I'm running, what kernel I have installed. And again, it's going to take a little bit of time for me to get file system layout and XVM statistics or reports to show me how my file systems are built. I want to check on interprocess communication. I want to check on the kernel slab. And I want to check on sysctl.com. And that's it.